Today we're going to learn how to set success metrics, also known as KPIs, for any product. This is arguably the most important skill you need to have if you're a product manager, growth manager, or a startup founder. Everything you do starts and ends with metrics that are used to measure the impact of your work, so you got to make sure you're good at developing those metrics. And don't worry, this method works both for when you're building a whole product from scratch or if you're adding features to an existing product. I use the term product for both cases. I'm going to start by explaining how this metric defining method works, and then we're going to do a few examples of applying it to products in different categories like software as a service, also known as SaaS, e-commerce, and content platforms, so you can see it in action and really understand how to apply it to your specific product. You should think of your product metrics as a pyramid. At the top you have one metric, and below it you have a row of other metrics that contribute to that metric at the top. Then each of those metrics have other metrics that contribute to them, and so on. You start with the first two rows when you're in the early stages of the product, and then you add more as the product becomes more sophisticated. It's kind of like how a startup works. When it starts, you have the founder, CEO, and maybe one or two co-founders. Then as the startup grows, those people each build out their own teams that report to them. Those new people build out their own teams, and so on. The point is, you start with the most overarching roles and get more granular over time as your business grows and becomes more sophisticated. The same thing applies for success metrics of a product. When we go through this method together, it's going to feel like it only focuses on the top two rows of the pyramid. And that's essentially true. But the beauty of it is that you can carve out your own smaller pyramids out of this big pyramid and apply this method to them too. Which is why it works for both a whole product and for specific new features of that product. You'll see exactly how as we work through the examples at the end of the video. This method focuses on six key metrics. They are exposure, onboarding, which is optional, activation, engagement, retention, and focus. In order to come up with these six metrics, your very first step is to map out the user's journey throughout your product at a high level. Specifically, you need to focus on three key points within a typical user journey. First, you have the point at which the user has their first exposure to your product. For a typical web app, this is when the user arrives at the homepage the first time and hasn't done anything else. For a mobile app, it's when they see the welcome screen after they download and open the app for the first time. Note that we are not counting the moment where they see an ad for your product or when they see it in the app store. We want the first moment that is actually a part of your product and you, as a product owner, have control over. This is your exposure moment. With most products, you have to create an account and go through some onboarding steps in order to use the product's core features. Some products creating an account is optional and some don't require it at all. This is why this particular key point is also optional. You can add it if onboarding is required for users to get access to key parts of your product, but not required otherwise. For now, we'll assume it's required. So the second key point we'll identify is the completion of onboarding. This is when you've input all your info, your account is created, and you're in the main part of the app, but you still haven't done anything to get value out of the app. The third point we identify is the key action of your product, an action that the user gets value from. And yes, I know that most products have several of these, but for now, just pick the most important one. If your product is a messenger, then this would be the act of sending a message. If it's a platform like YouTube, this is the act of watching a video. We call this the activation point. Now that we have these three, we're going to start defining all our metrics. You ready? Here we go. The first metric is called exposure, and it's the number of users who made it to the exposure point. Pretty simple. This metric looks at the very top of your product funnel, the beginning of your user journey, and is more of a reference point for the other metrics than a metric you'll be managing the product to. The second metric is onboarding success, which as you recall is optional. This metric looks at the conversion rate from exposure to onboarding completion, meaning the number of people who completed onboarding divided by the number of people who were exposed to your product. In some cases, there is a lot that a user can do in between exposure and when they start onboarding, in which case you can modify this metric to instead be defined as the number of people who completed onboarding divided by the number of people who started it. Both approaches are fine. Either way, this process is only done once per user, which is why we separate it from the other metrics. It's also a super key part of the product experience where many products lose a lot of users, so we want to make sure we can isolate its performance. The third metric is the activation rate. This metric looks at the conversion rate from onboarding completion to when the user takes a key action. So the number of users who activated divided by the number of users who completed onboarding. 
Remember that onboarding is optional. So if your product doesn't have onboarding, you can instead define it as the number of people activated divided by the number of people who were exposed to the product. Either way, the fundamental approach is the same. You're looking at the conversion rate from the previous key point of the journey to this one. This is a concept that we repeat throughout this method, so it's good to visualize it and remember it. The fourth metric is engagement rate. This metric looks at how much an active user is using your product, because not all active users are equal. For a messaging app, some users send a lot of messages, some only send a few. On YouTube, some users watch a lot of videos, some less. Just sending a message or watching a video means you're active, so we need a way to measure how active and engaged each specific user is. This metric is defined as the number of times key actions were done divided by the number of users who did that key action. So in the messaging app example, it's the number of messages sent per messaging user. In the YouTube example, it's videos watched per video watcher. Note that we're not saying videos watched per user. We're saying videos watched per video watcher. This is because dormant users can add a lot of noise to this metric if they get included in it. And whether a user remains dormant or takes a key action is already covered in our prior metric, which was the activation rate. So essentially, our engagement metric looks at how active each active user is. And then we have the retention rate. Retention is defined as a portion of your users who continue to take key actions in your product a fixed amount of time after they first activated. For example, 30-day retention looks at the number of people who are still active 30 days after they activated, divided by the number of users who activated in the first place. You can use different lengths of time for your retention metric based on your product, but 30 days and 90 days are the two most widely used ones. What we covered so far is that second row of the pyramid. It covers the user journey from when they're first exposed to the product, through their onboarding and activation, and finally whether they retained or churned. But we also need to look at the top of the pyramid, which is also known as the focus metric. For the focus metric, we look at your number of active users, either daily, weekly, or monthly active users. All of the metrics that we discussed earlier contribute to this top metric in a key way. A drop in any of those numbers is going to result in a drop in this focus metric. And if your focus metric is growing and looking healthy, your product is likely doing well. But if it's not, then you can use all these other metrics to isolate and diagnose the issues that are contributing to it, whether it's that your onboarding flow is broken, your users aren't activating, or anything else. So to recap, we have exposure, which is the number of people who got exposed to your product. We have onboarding completion, which is the number of users who completed onboarding divided by the number of users who were exposed to your product, or those who started onboarding. This metric is optional, depending on your product type. Then we have activation rate, which is the number of people who took a key action divided by the number of people at the prior key point of the journey, either exposure or onboarding completion. Next up is engagement, which measures how engaged our active users are and is defined as the number of key actions divided by the number of active users. And last, we have retention, which is the number of people who continue to take key actions after a fixed amount of time, such as 30 days, divided by the number of users who activated in the first place. And all of these metrics roll up to the focus metric, which is your number of active users. I highly recommend taking a screenshot of both this slide and the previous one that showed the user journey and keeping them handy. It summarizes everything we cover in this video and you can use it as a reference when you want to come up with metrics for your own product. Now that we've covered the concept, let's see it in action. We'll start with a fictional SaaS product. Imagine that you have a web app that allows you to create animations. It requires you to create an account, then gives you access to animating tools. You can start a new project where you'll be able to create drawings, animate them, and then publish the final result. We'll call this product, I don't know, Granimate. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not good with names and I just made this logo using a free logo generator, but it looks good enough for a fictional example so we can move on into setting success metrics for it. Now, remember the first step of the process. We gotta lay out the key points in the user's journey. The first one is the exposure point, which in this case is the web app's homepage. So it would be when user gets to granimate.com and it hasn't logged in yet. This fictional web app of ours also requires you to create an account before you use it. So we also mark our point of onboarding completion, which will probably be at a URL like app.granimate.com. The key action user will take is creating an animation. When someone creates an animation for the first time, you can consider them an activated user. Now let's lay out the metrics. The number of users who arrive at the homepage, granimate.com, is how we measure exposure. The onboarding success is the number of people who completed onboarding divided by the number who started onboarding. 
The activation rate is the number of people who create an animation divided by the number of people who complete onboarding. The number of animations created per active user is the engagement rate. The more animations each user creates, the more engaged they are. The retention rate is the percentage of people who create an animation after 90 days or more from when they activate. I went with 90 day retention in this case because I'm imagining this is a product used by professionals who will likely stick around a bit longer than hobbyists. And last but not least, the metric they all lead up to, the focus metric. Remember that we want active users, so it's just a matter of picking between daily, weekly, or monthly. The way I always decide this one is that I base it on the usage pattern of the users. Since this is a professional product, it'll likely get used a lot more on the weekdays than on the weekend. So it follows a weekly cyclical pattern, making weeks good units of time for comparing. So our focus metric will be weekly active users. Take a moment and review the formula for each metric. All right, now let's say you decide you want to get a bit more granular. You say, okay, creating animation means that you export a video file containing your animation. But what about the moment where the user starts creating an animation? That's super important too. That's totally fine. That's also a key moment. So just draw it on your user journey map and treat it like you treat any other key point. Measure your conversion rate from onboarding completion to starting a project. That can be your activation rate. And then have a second similar metric that looks at your conversion rate from starting a project to exporting the final animation file. See what I did here? I took the method we were applying so far and expanded it to address this use case with a very simple change while still following the overall same approach. You added one more conversion metric. You can even give it its own engagement rate by measuring the number of projects started per project starter. Essentially, you can take that same activation, engagement, and retention metric and apply it to any key point in the user journey. Now, let's say you add a new feature to this animation platform. You can create images using an AI image generator and add them to your animation. You want to see how this new feature is performing, so you take the same method and apply it to only this feature. Let's think of the user journey throughout this feature. There is a button or pop-up that the user sees informing them that this cool new AI image generated tool is an option. That's your exposure point. When you actually add an AI image generated by this tool to your animation, that's your key action. So your exposure metric is the number of people who saw the button or pop-up for this feature. Your activation rate is the portion of those exposed users who use the tool to add an AI generated image to their animation. Engagement rate is the number of images added per person who use the tool. And your retention rate is what percentage of activated users still use this tool 90 or more days later. The focus metric is again the number of weekly active users, except here active is defined as anybody who adds an image to their animation. This is an example of how this method works both for features in an existing product as well as a brand new product. One question you might ask yourself is why do we focus so much on using rates in our metrics instead of raw numbers? Like why do we look at onboarding completion rate and retention rate? Why don't we just look at how many users completed onboarding or how many users stuck around after 90 days? This is because we want to isolate the impact of that particular area of the product. If we use raw volume of users as the metric, then each metric will be heavily dependent on the ones before. If your onboarding develops a problem, then your activation and retention metrics will go down too. If your exposure metric goes down because your ad budget dropped, then all your downstream metrics will go down too. But if you normalize the metrics by looking at them as rates, for example, by dividing the number of users who finished onboarding by those who started it, then you'll be able to look at just how onboarding is performing. Exposure is the only exception here because it's the very top of the funnel, so there's nothing in the product before it that affects it. So you can keep it as a raw volume. And that's why we look at conversion rate, engagement rate, and so on, instead of looking at the raw number of users at each step. All right, let's do another example. Let's take YouTube as the product. The homepage is the start of the journey, and watching a video is your key action. Onboarding isn't required for watching a video, so we leave it out of this example. So your exposure metric is the number of people at the homepage. Your activation rate is the conversion rate from exposure to watching the first video. Your engagement rate is the number of videos watched per video watcher, and your retention rate is the percentage of activated users who still watch videos after 30 or more days. For the focus metric, I'll go with daily active user, because YouTube gets used by all sorts of people on all days of the week, so looking at it on a daily basis is totally fine. For our last example, let's look at an e-commerce product, because e-commerce products are a little different from most other products. Just imagine a site like Amazon. The exposure point is when you arrive at the homepage of the app. 
And the onboarding success rate is the conversion from beginning to the end of the account creation process. The activation can be when you make your first purchase, but a lot of times people may not buy from you, not because the product is bad, but because you just don't have the item they're looking for, or you do and it's too expensive, which isn't the fault of the product itself, but rather it's inventory. So I would look at the activation point as when a user looks at a page for a specific item. And then much like we did with our animation example, I'd add a second key action for when the user purchases something. Then you look at both the activation rate and also the conversion rate from looking at an item to buying that item. Your engagement rate will be your number of purchases per purchaser, and your retention rate is the percentage of buyers who come back and make another purchase after 30 days. Your focus metric can be the daily active users because e-commerce products typically get steady traffic on a daily basis. You can apply the same concept to pretty much any product. Remember, frameworks don't work perfectly well for literally every scenario, but they work pretty well for almost all of them. But with a bit of modification, just like the examples I showed you, you can apply them to whatever difficult use case you're dealing with. Just gotta do a few examples to get the hang of it, and you'll be the master of setting product success metrics. If you're curious if you're applying this method correctly, just post a comment under this video with a brief description of your product, the key points in the user journey, and the metrics you came up with. I'll reply to it and give you some feedback. As I said earlier in the video, learning to develop strong success metrics for your product is arguably the most important skill you develop as a product manager, so make sure you dedicate time to learning it well by doing examples. If you want to get even better at it, check out the link in the video description to a course that contains a whole section dedicated to product success metrics, as well as other sections for how to measure those metrics using tools like Mixpanel, how to apply metrics to split tests, and how to analyze your results. Thanks again for tuning in, and stay tuned for our future product analytics videos.